Hey guys, it's your girl Sage. I hope you're having a wonderful day or night whenever this video finds you. I'm here with our daily bread and for today we have the book of Luke, Luke chapter 8, Many Women Minister to Jesus. <clears throat> Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. The Parable of the Sower and when a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The Purpose of Parables Then his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables that, seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. The Parable of the Sower Explained now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. By Those by the wayside are the ones who hear, then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. Now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. The Parable of the Revealed Light No one, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but sets it on a lampstand that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Therefore, take heed how you hear. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and whoever does not have, even what he seems to have will be taken from him. Jesus' mother and brothers come to him. Then his mother and brothers came to him and could not approach him because of the crowd. And it was told him by some who said, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered and said to them, My mother and my brothers are those are these who hear the word of God and do it. Wind and wave obey Jesus. Now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. But he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, Who can this be? For he commands even the winds and water, and they obey him. A demon-possessed man healed. Then they sailed to the country of the Garadines, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there he met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time, and he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain. So they begged him that he would permit them to enter them, and he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran 
violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. When those who fed them saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. They also who they also who had seen it told them by what means he who had been demon possessed was healed. Then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gar- Garvadines asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear, and he got into the boat and returned. Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. A girl restored to life and a woman healed. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there was a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had only an only daughter, about twelve years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Now a woman, having a flow of blood for twelve years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, Who touched me? But Jesus said, Somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out of me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her daughter, Be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Do not be afraid. Only believe, and she will be made well. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, Do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand, and called, saying, Little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately, and he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about it. Um, I love reading uh, books from the New Testament, especially red texts. But while I was reading this, um, well, let's go ahead and talk about the chapter. So Luke chapter 8, we see that Jesus and his disciples, they are going around preaching and um, bringing down the good news that the kingdom of heaven is near and for those who repent. But also we're starting to see some of the healings and the actions that Jesus has done bearing fruit. We see that there's a lot of women who have received healing from him, healing of evil spirits, healing of infirmities that are coming to him and um, they're they're serving him because they know what great things he can do and they they know that he is son of God. Um, And then we see that Jesus goes on to talk about the parable of the sower where he describes the seeds um, going into going into the wayside and being eaten by birds seeds that fell on rock where there is no foundation for them to produce or to grow from there, seeds that of course fell within thorns and unfortunately the thorns made it impossible for the seed to grow, and um, seeds that fell on good ground and grew abundantly and bountifully. And I actually want to just stop for a second and, and talk about this because this is actually one of my favorite parables that um, Jesus speaks about, especially Luke eight eleven. Um, I actually wanted to put that on a hat, but you know, and I'm glad that Jesus d- explains it to his disciples. But I love when his disciples ask him, "Lord, why do you speak in parables?" Right here, he's actually making a reference back to the Old Testament, um, Isaiah um, chapter six, verse nine. Seeing, they may not see, and hearing, they may not understand. And I just found that to be really significant because uh, that's around when I say it's also talking about how 
wickedness and our selfishness makes it where we cannot have that relationship with the Lord and that understanding and that wisdom of the Lord because we're not delighting ourselves in the Lord. When we are delighting ourselves in things of the world, in pleasures of the world, our money, our jobs, uh, the amount of um, or vanity, whatever it might be, right? When we are indulging in those things, it actually blocks us to the wisdom of the of the Lord. It blocks us to wisdom. Even Solomon, I, I just want to mention this. King Solomon had sought out the Lord and has been greeted by the Lord twice. Um, and one of those times he was seeking the Lord that he would bless him with wisdom so he can lead his people. However, Solomon became one of the wisest kings in all of history. However, what happened? Solomon took for himself 700 wives, 300 concubines, and it was because of them that they that he was led away from the Lord. He ended up worshiping these false gods and building temples for these false gods. And what happened because of that? His son suffered the consequences of his father's sin. But nonetheless, um, the Lord is still a promise keeper. So despite the sin that Solomon had done, the Lord has still kept his promise to David by um, just kind of reducing the amount of territory that um, his sons would rule over. Um, but but I digress. I digress. I, I wanted to bring that up because what Solomon's mistake was, he was caught up in the lusts of the flesh. Again, he had taken for himself 700 wives, 300 women, um, and was quite the ladies' man. And because of that, it had skewed his relationship with the Lord, and because of that, he had fallen from the Lord's grace. Um, so I just wanted to bring up how important that is, um, because right here, um, again, that right here in Luke chapter 8, verse, I'm going to say 7, um, or 7, or actually, you know what, instead of 7, I'm going to talk about 14, because 14 is the interpretation of Luke chapter 8, verse 7. So now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. Again, just giving into the pleasures of life and the easy things of life and whatever seems to accommodate us right now, but not holding tightly onto the word of the Lord. Because um, we also know that there is a point where Jesus, um, where Jesus He's approached by a rich man who who lives a good life, who asks Jesus, what does it take for a man to enter into heaven? And Jesus says, truly, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and come and follow me. And he could not do that. He walked away sadly. So it was the pleasures of his life, you know, all the wealth he had accumulated that prevented him from being able to follow Jesus. Um, and that's a mon monetary value. Again, with Solomon, we see it happen from lust of the flesh. Um, and I mean, there's many other ways I can get into it, but I'm going to go ahead and just uh, continue on with my point here. So while I was reading this chapter, um, there's something really interesting that stood out to me. Luke chapter 8, verse 10. And he said, to you, it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest, it is given in parables that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. We know that Jesus is speaking from the book of Isaiah, but I also thought it was really interesting because um, we see there's a lot of um, repetition throughout the Old and the New Testament that the wicked would not be able to see or understand. But right here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine on them. The people, the people who are blinded by the God of this age, who is the God of this age? Who is the prince of this world as we know it? We know that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord of over all appointed by God. But who is the God of this age? The God of this age being, being, yeah, and when I say this age, I'm talking about right now while we are here dwelling in the flesh. It's the God of our flesh. It's the God that causes us to want to indulge in fleshly pleasures that Oh, go ahead and eat that extra cookie, you know? It's one cookie, it, and you really want it. You deserve it. 
or, or, you know, texting multiple people at the same time. And while there's whatever, right. Whatever being a, being a player or being whatever, you know, all for having our ego stroked. So we feel attractive in our flesh, things of that crappy nature, or, or perhaps, you know, forsaking people because, and not giving money to those in need because, Hey, that's my money. I worked for it. They should go get a job. Things of that nature. Um, it, it's that wicked nature that prevents a lot of people from being able to truly understand the importance of the parables that the Lord Jesus speaks. Again, I already mentioned it with, um, the story of the rich man who had approached Jesus, who lived a pretty good life, but he, even he could not part with his belongings and material wealth or his wife at home or his children at home to follow the Lord Jesus. But Jesus also tells us that whoever leaves behind their, their, um, wife, their parents, their, their husband, their kids, their friends, their family, whoever leaves all these things behind to follow him, they will be recompensed a hundredfold in heaven. And when Jesus is down here speaking in parables, preaching to the people the kingdom of God, he's preaching to them eternity. He's not talking about things of nowadays. You know, um, we have uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Pharisees were quite legalistic and believing, the um, following the word by every text down to the point to the point where it actually prevented them from being generous with others because they were kind of miserly considering the fact that they gave away a lot of their own possession to the poor and clung on to everything that they had because they felt they deserved it. Meanwhile, the Sadducees, on the other hand, um, didn't even care for that. The Sadducees, actually, they believed that Yes, they were similar to the Pharisees in the way that they would tithe um, very down to the last increment to the people in need, but they believed everything that they were doing was to receive a reward in the next life, that, that their wealth would be part of their reward. Um, and Jesus rebukes both groups on this. Um, but nonetheless, nonetheless, going on into the rest of this chapter that that we see that there's four different groups of people that are addressed here we see that there are those that when they receive the word of god that it's the devil that comes and takes that away from them and uh let's go ahead and break that down really quick so the devil taking away the word of god from them often falls onto the ears of those who they're too limited by by um science, if you will, even though the Bible actually does talk about scientific discoveries that were made centuries after it being written, um, that, that there's people who believe that God and the Bible can't coexist when in reality, God is the one that created science. So it really just makes no sense that people separate the two. Um, but nonetheless, there are some people who, when they hear the gospel, that it's through our faith that we are saved, not by our good works, not by being a good person, but only through our faith in the Lord Jesus that we are saved. Because the truth is, none of us are, none of us are good. Jesus tells us that none of us are good, that we have all sinned and fallen short of, of the glory of God. But thankfully, the good news is that through him, we receive forgiveness and through him, we could be redeemed. And through him, we receive the gift of salvation of eternal life with the Heavenly Father. Because um, Jesus is the one that when he sacrificed himself for our sins, he covered all of our sins, our sins of our past, our sins of now, even our sins of the future that we that we may unfortunately commit. Jesus covered it all. That's what all means. Um and there's unfortunately some people that when they hear the gospel, they think it's gullible that that it's only through our faith that we are saved. They think a lot of Christians that follow in the way of Jesus are gullible. Um, so that's and and truly that's um that's Satan at play right there, 
making them believe and trust in their own intellect and their own ways of thinking and forsaking the one who had the intellect to create them exactly as they are. Um, I actually mentioned this in another video recently where, you know, there's a story about God versing a scientist on who can make a man faster. And so the scientist challenges God and God says, okay, and they get to work. But the scientist, he starts grabbing elements and God says, whoa, hold on. You can't use the elements I made. You have to make those yourself. And right there, it really, um, it just really highlights, um, who the Lord God is. Um, and when I say that, I mean that he's the one that designed everything here down to the smallest increment, down to the smallest atom. God created all things. And, um, unfortunately you have, um, a lot of people who lean on their own understanding of how things are done. Um, but nonetheless, nonetheless, the ones on the rock, they are those who, you know, they're the ones that when they hear, they're happy about it, but they don't really ingest the word. They don't really receive the word. They don't receive the eternal, the eternal water that Jesus provides, the living water that Jesus provides. They don't truly receive him. They like what they hear, but they, there's again, a lack of foundation for them. Um, because also if you've ever tried to plant a seed on rock, it doesn't really grow at all. Um, it needs soil to do that soil for it to germinate and whatnot. Um, so while we do see that, um, there is a point where, um, the Lord makes another parable about a house being built on rock. A seed, on the other hand, would not grow on rock. So again, those that hear the word and they're excited about the word, but as soon as temptation comes, they they don't have any true foundation in the Lord, so they fall easily to temptation. Um, and then, of course, we have those that um, where the word has fallen among thorns. These people, they really want to believe. They really want to believe more than anything, but it's unfortunate that some of the sufferings that we go through in life cause it where, where people may turn away from God and may turn away from the promises that he speaks to us and to have faith in him that he's in control of all things. Some of the things that happen to us cause us to feel scorned and we turn away. And that's why it's referred to as the thorns. Um, but also, other thorns being pleasures that we can't part from. For example, um, the best one I could think of is perhaps somebody who maybe is in the middle of two dates and there's one date that they really love and then there's a date that their flesh loves, that they love lusting after, but they don't truly love. But maybe they accidentally knocked up this one and this one that's knocked up is threatening to tell the, the one that's truly loved that she is carrying the person's baby. Um, I know that's a little bit of messy drama, but, but really it's, it's, it becomes a thorn at that point. Um, what once was fun and sinful has now become a thorn. Um, and, and I know that's a crude example. I do apologize, but I'm just trying to pull off of off of the top of my head here so I can kind of get through this word because I do understand this is a bit of a longer word, but we finally have the fourth group of people, the ones that fell on good ground, the ones that they received the word of the Lord and with pure hearts. Granted, I'm not saying they're good people. We're all sinners. We've all messed up, but that doesn't mean that, that everybody is self-indulging and self-seeking. You know, there's a lot of people that while they try their best, they fall short. And even then they try their best every way. You know, the Lord knows our hearts. And it's these people that are truly repentant, that truly seek the Lord, that truly know that we need the Lord's help if any of us are going to ever make it in this life. They are the ones that put their faith in the Lord. They are the ones that receive the word and they are the ones that produce the fruits of the spirit later on. So nonetheless, we get into another parable, the parable of the revealed light, where Jesus speaks about when somebody lights a lamp, they don't just put it 
under the, they don't put it under the table. They don't put it under the bed. They don't cover it. They use that lamp to light a room. And just like what we're called to do, that's why Jesus calls us the light of the world, that we are called to shed light in this dark world that we live in. We live in a time where good is evil and evil is good, where we're, th good is called evil and evil is called good. And we are called as followers of Jesus to be the light, to shine the light that the Lord God has put in us, to shine the light of truth on this dark world that we live in. There's so many who the gospel is veiled to because they're blinded by their own wickedness. They're blinded by the darkness of this world that has caused them to suffer, that has caused them to be hurt, that has caused them to, to feel scorned by the Lord. And the truth is, it's they're blind to the truth. And that's why we are called to be that light, you know, and to not be afraid to shine that light upon other people in every platform that the Lord places us on. So, and right here, the Lord, um, Jesus also speaks in uh, Luke chapter uh, 8, verse 18. Therefore, take heed how you hear. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have will be taken from him. What he's speaking about here is responsibility. That, you know, whoever has this responsibility, to him more will be given. But... Whoever does not have, whoever does not take upon themselves the responsibility to share this light, this gospel, this truth, even what they think they have will be taken from them. People often will, people will often uh, be afraid to evangelize or to share the light of the truth of the gospel to others because they're afraid of losing what they have. They're afraid that they're going to lose rank in their job. They're afraid that they're going to lose friends. They are afraid that they are going to lose material valuables here. They are afraid of what other people are going to think of them. But also, I want to remind you that the Lord does not give us a spirit of fear, but he gives us a spirit of power and self-discipline. That that when we feel fearful, that that fear is often coming from a place of malice. Because again, when we know that the Lord God is on our side, why should we be afraid of fellow man? Why should we be afraid of those who can only kill the body and not afraid of the one who can kill the body and the soul? So really, he's talking about how important it is to share the light of who the Lord God is to truly share who the Lord is and so that people may have an opportunity, a chance to receive the truth. You know, unfortunately, nowadays, there's so many people who who are too stubborn or refusing the truth because they don't know any better. They blame God for why bad things have happened and not understanding that God is not the problem. Our sin is the problem. But that's also why, despite our sin, that the Lord God loves us so much that he gave us a way. He gave us a way out of our sin. He gave us a way that if we follow him, that we would be saved. And of course, um, then we see that Jesus' mother and brothers come to him. And he actually rejects his mother and brothers from being able to approach him, not because he doesn't want to see them, but because he is fully confident in the fact that all of the people surrounding him, we are all one family. That's why we're called to love one another as our fellow brother and sister. You know, we are called to love one another as family because we are all children of God. So then, of course, we get into the story of uh, the wind and the waves obey Jesus. It's one of my favorites because um, whenever I read it, I always kind of imagine it as... Um, Jesus being kind of like the older brother out of the entire group and everybody's kind of afraid of like a boogeyman and um, they're like, hey, can you can you take care of this for us? We're, we're scared. We don't know what to do. And it's fair. They don't know what to do. But so Jesus tells the wind and the waves to silence. He tells them to stop because they're scaring his disciples. And then he says, where is your faith? Um, and it's interesting that he says that where is your faith? Um, after calming them down because, you know, 
He's asking them, where is their faith when it was happening? Sometimes we go through stormy seasons. Sometimes we go through a lot of turbulent, um, a lot of turbulent times. And we are called to have faith in the Lord God during those times that we are called to have faith in the Lord God's plans for us. For he knows the thoughts he has towards us, plans to help us prosper, not to harm us, but to give us hope in the future. We are called to have faith in the Lord. And if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. But to nonetheless, to remember that our lives, our fate, our future is entirely in the hands of the Lord. So that's why Jesus is saying, where is your faith? Because they were scared for their flesh. But at the same time, Jesus was the one that had told them, commanded them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. Jesus already knew what was going to happen over the waters. Jesus, he wanted his disciples to trust that he was with them as the Lord God promises all of us, that the Lord God promises he's with all of us, that he will never leave or forsake us, that he will be with us while we were in the fire, that he will be with us in the waters and that the waters will not overtake us. Jesus is asking them, where's their faith? That the Lord God is with them at all times, whether they're on the mountains, whether they're in the, I want to say plateau, but in the, in the valleys or the shadows or mountains or valleys, excuse me. But nonetheless, that's what Jesus is questioning them on. And, um, again, I really love it because it, it reminds me a lot of a big brother checking the closet for like a boogeyman that the little kids are afraid of. But in reality, you know, Jesus is the one that we call upon when we are afraid. But also for us to remember that sometimes we go through turbulent seasons of our life because it's to help build our faith, to increase and stretch our faith in the Lord. And then, of course, going on to um, this middle of the chapter, we have the demon-possessed man who is healed. We know that this demon is named Legion because there are many demons residing within this man. We also know that this man is not living in a house. He's not living um, wearing clothes for that manner. Um, the lack of clothes is actually to indicate his shame. And living in the tombs is to indicate his death. So it's the same way that when we ourselves are living with demons and we're not and we're not giving them over to Jesus when um, we're not calling upon Jesus to help us with our demons, that we ourselves live a life of shame that will lead to our death. We may think that a way is right, but that way leads to death. So, and, and, and that's really kind of stretching the symbolism of this. But the truth is, I know that many of us, while we even walk around and say that we love Jesus, many of us ourselves are struggling with demons. And even those who do not follow in the way of Jesus are struggling with demons. We see it all the time. Um, so, nonetheless, and it's interesting because I, I want to read this right here. Luke chapter 8, verse 28. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. Even the demons know who Jesus is. Even demons know who Jesus is. And that's why, especially this day and age, Christianity is the only religion that is mocked. None of the other religions are mocked. Nobody's mocking Islam. Nobody's mocking Hinduism. Nobody's mocking Buddha. Nobody's mocking any of these other major religions um, or Wu Wei, whatever, nobody is mocking these religions because they know it holds no power. These religions have no power. Jesus, on the other hand, there is power in the name of Jesus. And that's why Satan's working around the clock to put down Christianity and the name of Jesus as much as possible. Did you know that in Hollywood, and uh, especially with music production, there is a special contract that many major um, artists are told to sign that says they are not allowed to mention the name of Jesus in their music? Did you know that? Um, and there's actually people who have walked away from that life who can tell you this, um, who can testify to this. Um, but nonetheless, nonetheless, even demons know that there is one God. Even demons know, and they shudder. So I just wanted to bring that up. But... Nonetheless, Jesus, he casts out the demons. And it's interesting because 
He's doing a good thing here. He's casting out the demons into the swine and the swine run and kill themselves because they can't live with the demons in them. Um, it's, it's too much. So they all kill themselves. And the people of the town nearby, they hear of this. They are terrified. And instead of rejoicing in the fact that this man had been healed of the demons that resided within him, that he was finally wearing clothes and in his right mind, they instead tell Jesus to leave because they are afraid of him. They are rejecting Jesus because they are afraid of him casting out the demons and what that did. Isn't that interesting? There, First off, there truly is power in the name of Jesus. That's why we're called to not say the Lord's name in vain. But it's so interesting that despite Jesus doing a good thing, that he was sent away by these people. I want to bring that up because, again, there's a lot of people who are afraid to shed the light of the gospel onto others. But the truth is, it's really the light that irritates demons. You know how hard it is for the boogeyman and demons to hide in a well-lit room? That's why when children are afraid of the dark, you know, they, they want a nightlight because it's that light that illuminates the room in the same way that it's the light of the gospel that provides us with safety and comfort in knowing the truth. So despite Jesus doing a good thing and casting out these demons, he's still sent away. So the truth of the matter is that we can do a good thing. We can share the light of the gospel and we still may be rejected for it. We may cast out demons and we still may be rejected for it. No matter, no matter, Jesus returns to a group that welcomes him and such a great group that when Jesus is being led by a man named Jairus to heal his daughter who is sick and dying, that he can't even push through these people like they are literally shoving and holding people back much like a very popular celebrity who's getting overwhelmed with fans right jesus is being flocked by these people to the point where his disciples are trying to shove back other people and we see that there's a woman who she's been sick for about 12 years and has been bleeding for 12 years that she has spent everything she could to be healed because i'm just gonna say it to bleed for 12 years i mean some of us can barely even handle three days a week Oof, i cannot imagine 12 years so i could also imagine how desperate she was to be healed especially because back then when a woman bled it was seen that she was unclean that she was unclean filthy and could not be touched by anybody. She became less than a person when she was unclean back in these times in this culture. Um, and even nowadays, there's still a lot of negative stigma about a woman who's bleeding. But imagine, I mean, that's 12 years of that pain. That is intense. So I, I personally don't blame her for pushing through with all of her strength and might to be healed by the Lord Jesus. And it was her faith that healed her. Jesus even confirms this. Nobody, there is nothing in the Bibles, nothing in the Old Testament, nothing, or the Torah, I should say. There is nothing that states if she touches him, she'll be healed. It was her faith, something in her mind, the Lord God had spoken in her mind that if she would just touch the hem of his garment, that she would be healed. And Jesus confirms this right here, Luke chapter eight, verse 48. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well, go in peace. I know there's some translations that mention uh, just daughter, your faith has made you well, go in peace. But nonetheless, Jesus is praising her that it was her faith in him that she would be healed. And Jesus even goes on to say that again um, over to Jairus right here in um, Luke chapter 8, verse 50. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, do not be afraid, only believe and she will be made well. Again, it's about our belief. It's about our faith in the Lord Jesus. Jesus was going to heal this girl. He made that promise to Jairus when Jairus sought him for it. Only believe and she will be made well. It is through faith and believing in the Lord Jesus that we would be made well, but that we would be have the demons cast out of us, that we would receive healing. We know that everything that Jesus spoke was the truth. And so when Jesus spoke that he would be destroyed 
and brought back after three days, and and he was, and he had doubting Thomas touching him, we know that everything that the Lord Jesus had spoken was truth, that he truly is the Son of God, and even demons know that. But that's really the beauty of, of you know, I, I gotta I apologize to you guys, because Luke chapter 8 is so eventful that there was a lot of ground to cover, but, you know... Truly, this chapter is all about having faith in the Lord. You know, we see in the very beginning all these women who were catering and taking care of the Lord and his disciples that, you know, it was all product of the the healing that he had received or that they have re received from him. You know, but this is all about faith. Jesus rebukes his disciples when they are scared of the tumultuous wind and water. He rebukes them saying, where is your faith? When Jesus is speaking about the word of the, uh, when Jesus is speaking about the word of God in the parable of the seeds, he's speaking about those who hold on to that seed with faith. Their hearts are faithful to the Lord. Everyone else is, everyone else is they're deceived. They they live in deception of the fact that um, they're living veiled to the gospel of the good truth, of the truth, excuse me. They The ones that are on the rock, they are slaves to their flesh. The ones that are caught in thorns, they are caught in the thorns of the consequences of overindulgence in their flesh. And then there are those that, that with a pure, repentant heart are seeking the Lord. And when they receive the word of the Lord, that is when it is planted in good ground. This is all about faith. All about faith and, and our faith in the Lord God's love for us and the Lord God's love in all of his children. That's why Jesus, he turns away. He doesn't turn them away. He just doesn't let them approach because he's got too many other people around him. That everyone is his mother. That everyone is his brother. That all are family. Again, it's going down to believing in the Lord God, believing in the Lord God's love for us, and having faith in his love for us as well. That the Lord God, he, when he created us in our mother's womb, fearfully and wonderfully made, when he made us carefully in our mother's womb, our mother might forget us, but he will not forget us because we are engraved in his hands. He formed us with his hands and to have faith in the believe in the love that he has for us. But nonetheless, uh, I could definitely see that I've been rambling on for a little while now. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this word up here. I am praying that this message bless someone. And if it did, please leave a like, subscribe. And until next time, I hope all of y'all take care. Bye-bye.